And so I'm wondering, we're basing our whole end times, our whole end times philosophy of what's going to happen on 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where the word rapture is not in there, you have to kind of assume that that's what the writer's talking about, don't you? You have to assume that from the text. And so I'm wondering if we should base our whole understanding of the end times on one verse, written by the Apostle Paul, or the, whether we should look at the other stuff that he said and see how that lines up with what he says is going to happen at the end. Don't you think that's the best way to interpret Scripture? It's not to pull one thing out and say, oh, this is how it's going to be and literalize it, but instead look at the other places where the writers talk about that same event and then put the, all the pieces together and say, now this makes a little more sense. And so we're going to do that today for just a couple minutes. Um, George, I'm going to ask you to help me if you would. And uh, if you want to grab a couple of tissues, we need to wipe some of that board off. I'm going to let you be my van after today. <laughs> Plus you can spell. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at three other scriptures where the Apostle Paul talks about the end times. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you guys to tell me what the key words are in these verses for Joyce to write down. In other words, what are the key things that Paul is saying is going to happen to us when Jesus comes back from these other verses? And the first one comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. There's some people turn it, so I'll give a second. All right. Paul says this, Since then, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Now listen to what he says in verse 4. He says, For when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. What's the key word? What's going to happen to you? Huh? You're going to appear. Now what he says? That you're going to appear with him in glory. You ever been in a dark room? And you walk in and you're trying to find the light. And when you finally find the light, somebody jumps out and scares you. Been hiding in the room. Because you couldn't see clearly until the light came on. And then all of a sudden they appeared, right? Right? I understand the word appear to mean that we will see things instantly differently than we ever have before. That we will be able to see the kingdom of God in its full glory. And so he says we will appear with him in glory. The word glory does not refer to heaven. It refers to dignity, honor, praise, and worship. That's the definition of glory. And so he says that we will appear. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Starting with verse 22. It says this. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn. Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he is destroyed, this is important. Steve, this plays into what we're talking about. Steve's doing this on Sunday, in Sunday school, too. Talking about the end time. So if you have questions next week, guess what? <laughs> Go ask Steve. 9 o'clock, Sunday morning. And so, but, but he says this. He says, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Does it sound like Jesus is going to leave anything, leave anything undone? No. He is here and he's not messing around. When he comes in the second coming, he is coming to wipe out death and destruction and the curse. And so in that verse 22, it says, uh, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. What's the key word? Alive. They will be made alive. Okay? And I think that refers to not just the people that have died, but to you and me. You think we're living now. Wait until you are transformed by the eternal, final power of God on this earth. You haven't seen what living is yet. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, on down a few verses. Verse 51, the Apostle Paul says something else about when Jesus comes back. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, he says, but we will all be changed. In a flash, into the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet... For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. You 
know what that means, right? That eternal, you'll be raised eternal in your perfect heavenly body. And he says, and we will be changed. What's the key word? Changed. And we're going to be changed. Okay? Now let's look at the last one. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. What's going to happen to us? We're going to be transformed, right? So we've got these, these words where the Apostle Paul in three other passages start to talk to us about what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. And he says that we're going to appear, that we're going to be made alive, that we're going to be changed. He says changed twice in that verse. And he says that we're going to be transformed. Transformed. Now put that together with what we talked about last week. I mean, if a new heaven and earth are joined together and God comes to live with us and be with His people, where are we going? Where are we going? I don't understand. I'm starting to really get a glimpse of this. Even 1 Thessalonians is clear about this. He says, and we will be with the Lord forever. Now, I want you to understand something that kind of helps me this week. When the Apostle Paul was talking about us meeting Jesus in the air, the key words are not in the air. The key words are to meet. You know why? Because when a king in that day, and again, you know, we don't think about terms of kings. I mean, we don't have a king coming to our town. Most we can get close to that is like if a presidential visit to Columbus or something. But when they were in that culture and they had kings, then when that king was coming to their town, they wouldn't sit in town and wait for the king to come to them. They would, out of respect and honor for their king, go out to meet him before he got to their town. And N.T. Wright explains that when the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians said they will go to meet him in the air, that it wasn't that they were leaving earth, but they were going to meet Jesus and usher him down into his new heaven and earth that we've talked about from Revelation chapter 21. Does that make any sense? Does that help at all? I mean, it's just biblically accurate to me. The things that I'm starting to understand about this picture. And thanks, Joyce. Thank you, Sam. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you, Joyce. Let's give her a round of applause. So this is our final destination, according to Revelations. That's a really bad cloud. And... Um, The kingdom of God, however that's going to that's going to be, that Jesus and God, they're going to remove the curse, redeem the world, make a new creation with the city of God, and we're going to be here, according to Revelations, with Him. If we could have the worship team come on, we'll get ready to close. But here's my biggest question for you today, and that is: Is this where you're going to go? If Jesus came back today in all of His glory, would He know you? I don't mean did you go to church. I mean, did, would He know you? Big difference. I mean, if you, you know, I've sat and talked to a lot of people and say, if you haven't asked Jesus into your heart and made a personal relationship with Him, it doesn't matter how often you attend church, how often you pray, how often you read your Bible. It's about a personal relationship with a living Savior that you give your life to. That's what the Bible says salvation is. And anything short of that is just a game we're trying to play to get half of what we want and half of what God wants. And it's not going to be honored. God calls us to total surrender. Let's stand. There's a couple scriptures. Uh, I don't think we need to put them on the screen. But you guys know these verses. It's basically what the whole movie Left Behind is based on. The Bible says that Jesus, as he talks about the end time, says two, will be, two women will be working at the hand mill. One will be taken. And what happens to the other one? They're left. 
right? Two men will be working in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two people will be sleeping, one will be taken and one will be left. And I want you to hear what Luke says in verse 37. When somebody asks Jesus, okay, Lord, where are these people that are leaving? Where are they going to go? Now, this is really powerful for our twisting our understanding to a biblical viewpoint. He said, he replied, where there is a dead body, the vultures will gather. Does that sound like we're going to heaven if, if, we're, if we're being taken, that we're taken up? Where there's a dead body, the vultures will gather. Vultures were a symbol of evil. See what I'm wondering is if maybe the people that are taken aren't taken to heaven somewhere out there. But maybe those are the ones that are being taken by the enemy and removed from the earth so God can have it for his people. Maybe the ones that are left behind are the ones that are supposed to be left behind because they know Jesus. And the people that are taken are dragged off to destruction because they never knew and had a relationship with Jesus. It bothers me a lot as a pastor and I hope it bothers you a lot as a Christian to know that there are people that you know that are still playing the game, that want God when they need Him, but have never surrendered their life to Jesus. And to know what that means for them eternally. If you haven't made that decision, today is the time, right now. So before we sing this closing song, I want to just have a prayer. Let's bow our heads. Lord, you know every heart that's here. I believe that every person in this room believes in you. But I would venture to guess that maybe there's some of us that are still playing a game. Trying to earn points with you without giving over our life. And so Lord, right now, I just pray that maybe there would be a few here today that would say it's time to surrender. It's time to give my whole life to Jesus that when he comes back to reign on this earth that I get to be there with him and with all of my friends and loved ones that have committed their lives to Jesus. But I don't have to be dragged away by the enemy. Today you face that choice.